Hello, Sin and Space listeners. This week, there's the character death, as well as some reasonably graphic depictions of injury. Other than that, you're good to go. Please enjoy. Sin and Space, Chapter 21. You ought to get the test finished in a few minutes, but if you're ready, you might as well start now. It's a hundred to one chance against its being anything but cave dirt. Joe Gracie crumbled between skinny, sensitive fingers a bit of soil taken from the nursery floor. As soon as we get the transceiver, Meany said. Harb's bringing it over now. Anna appeared in the doorway. She's conscious now. Tony went back into the bedroom. Polly? Her eyelids fluttered open and closed. Her pulse was stronger, but she wasn't really ready to talk. He had to try, without a stimulant if possible. What happened, Polly? he asked. What's the use? she said feebly. What's the use? We tried and tried on Earth, and I just got sick, and we had Sonny here, and now they've taken him. It isn't any good. "'Who's taken him, Polly?' "'I went out to clean the windows. "'I cleaned the front window, and then I went around to clean the back window. "'When I looked in, Sonny was gone. That's all. "'They took him. They just took him.' "'Who took him, Polly?' "'I don't know. Brownies? We tried and tried on Earth.' "'The doctor took Anna to one side. "'She's too lucid,' he whispered. "'Do you hear anything?' "'Hardly anything.' Anna shook her head. She's numb. She's more conscious than she looks. Just numb. Doesn't care. Shock, Tony muttered. There will be a reaction. She shouldn't be left alone. I'll stay, Anna offered. No, not you. We'll need you along with us. I'd rather not, she said. Ancy, he pleaded, biting back his angry disappointment. I shouldn't have told you, she said dully. I should never have told anybody. All right, I'll go. He smiled and gripped her arm. Of course you will. You would have anyway. No, she said. I wouldn't. Then maybe it's a good thing you told me. His voice was stern, but his hand pulled her closer to him. Polly twisted on the bed and sobbed. Anna pulled away. Maybe, she bit her lip, looked up at him. Only please don't be angry at me. I can't stand it if you keep getting angry at me. She turned and fled. Tony went back to the bed, erasing Anna and her problems from his mind with practiced determination. Polly was trembling uncontrollably. There was no more information to be had from her. He gave her a sedative and went out to join the others. Harf had arrived with the transceiver in his hand. On Anna's suggestion, a rush call was sent for Hank Radcliffe to stay with Polly. He didn't know about Joan. They decided not to tell him about it. We need a man here with her, the doctor explained briefly. The baby's disappeared, and we're going out now to try and track it. Polly might want to get up and follow. You keep her in bed. Sure, Doc. Nick Cantrello will be over with some equipment. Tell him to test Polly. They left the house, Mimi and Anna and the doctor, Jim Candro, Harv Stillman, and Joe Gracie. Look at that. Gracie was bending over in the road, pointing to the barely discernible mark of a bare toe, here in the bottom of the old canal bed, where the settlement was built. The land retained a trace of moisture, enough to hold an impression for a while. Only part of a toe, but it pointed a direction. They headed up the street past the huts toward the landing field. Hey, Joe! Someone was pounding up the hill after them, shouting. It was one of the men from the agro lab. That test, it's from the hills, all right, most likely from inside a cave, but hill dirt. That all you wanted? Right, thanks. They told me you wanted the word fast, the man said curiously. Glad I caught you. Glad you did, Gracie agreed mildly. Thanks again. He turned his back to the man. Let's go. They topped the slight rise that marked the farthest extent of the old riverbed's former intonations and faced a featureless expanse of level desert land, broken only by the lazy girl, chalked on the landing field at their left, and the hills in the distance. No other human being was in sight. It was hopeless to look for footprints here in the constantly shifting dust. The hills, Mimi said. Tony looked at Anna. She shrugged almost imperceptibly. Might as well, he agreed. They moved forward, Kandro striding ahead with his great hands knotted into bony fists, his eyes set on the hills, unaware of the ground under his feet or of the people with him. It was Harb who found the print they had known was impossible, not really a footprint, but a spot of moisture fast evaporating, still retaining a semblance in the shape of a human foot. A little farther on there was another. They were going the right way. Tony stopped for a minute at one of the damp spots, poked a finger curiously into the ground, grit and salt as he had expected. 
she could have lived through it. He didn't know how she got as far as she did, but even if her heart held out, she must have sweated her life away to have left those damp indicators in the thirsty soil. Only a little farther, and the ground began to be littered with the refuse of the Rimrock Hills, here and there a sliver of stone, a drift of mineral salts. Gradually the dust gave way to sharp rock and hard-packed salt pans, and the footprints of sweat gave way to footprints of blood. Mimi drew in her breath between her teeth at the thought of the sick girl stumbling barefoot over the slicing, rager-edged stones. "'I see her,' Kandra whispered, still striding ahead. They raced a kilometer over the jagged rock and planned off salt crust to the girl's body. She lay prone, with her right arm flung up and pointing to the Rimrock Hills. Tony peeled back her eyelid and reached for the pulse. He turned to his bag, and Anna, blessed Anna, was already getting out the hypodermic syringe. Adrenaline? He nodded. Swiftly and efficiently, she prepared the hypo and handed it to him. He bent over the girl busily, then sat back to wait. He glanced at Anna and straightened up quickly. What is it? Her face was withdrawn and intense, her head held back like an animal scenting the wind. She scanned the broken waist and pointed a hesitant finger. Out there, it's that way, moving a little. Kandra was on his way before she stopped speaking. Stillman shaded his eyes and peered. A rock in the heat haze, he pronounced finally. Nothing alive. Tony saw Anna shake her head in a small involuntary disagreement. They stood and waited in a tense small circle until Jim reached the spot. He looked down and they saw him hesitate, then move on with the same determined stride. Gracie lit out after him. Mimi murmured approval. There was no telling what Kandra might do in his present mood. A barely audible noise from the ground, and Tony was on his knees beside Joan. Her eyes went wide open, shining with an inner glory that was unholy in the dirt-streaked, blood-stained, dead white of her face. She smiled, as a child might smile, with perfect inner composure. She was pleased with herself. Joan, the doctor said, can you talk? Yes, of course. But she couldn't. She only mouthed the words. Does it hurt any place? She shook her head, or started to, but when she had turned it to one side, she lacked the strength to bring it back. No. This time she forced a little air through the sound of a word. She was dying, and he knew it. If it were only the heart, he might have been able to save her, but her body had been punished too much. It had given up. The water and the air that had kept it alive were spent. Her body was a dead husk, in which for a moment, abetted by the little quantity of adrenaline, her heart and brain refused to die. He had to decide. They needed what information she might have. She needed every bit of energy she had to live out what minutes were left. The minutes didn't matter, he told himself. He knew, Evan, even as he made up his mind, that this, like the ghost baby, would haunt him all his life. If he were wrong, if she had any chance to live, he was committing murder. But another life hung in the balance, too. Listen to me, Joan. He put his mouth close to her face. Just say yes or no. Did you see somebody take the Candro's baby? Yes. She smiled up at him beautifully. Do you know who it was? Yes. No. I saw... Don't try to talk. You saw the kidnapper clearly. Yes. Then it was someone you don't know. No. Yes. I'll ask it differently. Was it a stranger? Yes. She looked doubtful. Anyone from the colony? No. A man? No. Maybe. A woman? No. Someone from Pitco? She didn't answer. Her eyes were staring at him. The doctor had rolled her over, and the arm was at her side, stretched out. She let out a weird cry of fury and frustration. Tony watched and listened, puzzled, till Anna bent over. "'It's all right, Joan,' she said softly. "'You showed us. We saw the way it pointed. Jim is going that way now.' The girl's eyes relaxed, and once again the dreadful light of joy shone from them. "'Love me,' she said distinctly. I helped, finally. Tony! He bent over. She was trailing off again, less breath with each word. She might have minutes left or seconds. Nobody believed me. Or them. It was... She stopped, gasping, and the quiet smile of content gave way to a twisted grin of amusement. Brownie, she said, and said no more. Tony closed her eyes and looked up to Anna's serene face. 
he saw that they were alone with the body of a dead girl. Where? He got to his feet, carefully dulling sensation, refusing to feel anything. Over there. She pointed to where two figures stooped over something on the ground. Farther off, Kandro's tall figure, still resolutely facing toward the hills, was being restrained by a smaller man. Joe Gracie? That meant it was Mimi and Harv close by. They found something? Somebody, she corrected, and couldn't control a small shudder. Tony started forward. You better stay with Joan, he said with difficulty, hating to admit any weakness in her. I'll call you if... if we need you for anything. Thank you. She was more honest about it than he could be. They saw him coming twenty meters off. It's Graham, Mimi called. The lying bastard steals babies, too, Harv spat out in disgust. It looks bad, Mimi said quietly. We didn't touch him. We were waiting for you. Good. The doctor bent down and felt along the torso for broken bones. Carefully, he rolled the writer over. Graham's puffed eyes opened. Through broken lips with dried blood crusted on them, he rasped jeeringly, Come back to finish the job? Goddamn cowards, sneak up on a man. Goddamn cowards. None of our people did this to you, Tony said steadily. His hands ran over the writer's battered head and neck. The left clavicle was fractured, his nose was broken, his left eardrum had been ruptured by blows. Let's get him back to the hospital, he said. Harv, tell the radio shack to raise Marsport. Get Bell. Tell him we need that bloodhound. Tell him I will not take no for an answer. 